I would like a, a brief view on you on what, what did you find that was totally unexpected and what, what, what was confirmed in terms of what were your expectations? Just one or two sentences, thanks. In any particular order. Should I start? Should I start? Yes. yes. Um, well, I'm, I'm really pleased to have had the chance to judge and not only judge, but taste wines in the evening. Um, I had spent a bit of time here in Chile, but 10 years ago. So for me, the big surprises were the uh, large number of boutique-style wineries um, that have popped up, the diversity of the regions. I'm afraid I had sort of memorized six and realized I'm very out of date. I was um, a little disappointed in the Carmenere, because I've always liked Carmenere, and uh, for me as a class, it, it didn't sing in the way I expected. I was completely shocked by the Riesling. Um, that was just a real pleasure and something I never would have associated with Chile before. I thought the Syrah was superb, incredible diversity of style and flavor, and uh, they had true personality. Uh, so those were some of the highlights for me. And uh, also, I must say, I really enjoyed the Carignan tasting with Vigne. And I liked to see the winemakers working together. Um, I liked the enthusiasm, but also this uh, cohesive message that I feel I can write about and share with Asia. It's a story I can tell. And I also enjoyed the Movi tasting. Um, it's great to see people working together. Uh, so those were my impressions. Thank you very much. Tony? Uh, just a couple things. I'm really happy with the, what I think is, it looks like a new structure to me uh, in the wine business. When I first came here, it seemed like uh, the people that owned the company and ran the company uh, in, in some ways directed the company, which I know sounds normal. Uh, but today I feel like the winemakers and the viticulturalists have much more say about the direction of what's going on at the wineries and I think it's very important uh, that these people have a strong say in the business because they're the ones that are going to explore that, you know, that terroir and, and eventually make the wine. So there needs to be a, a strong partnership between the money and the people who can uh, grow those grapes and make the wine. So I'm pretty happy with the way that's developing and I think that will, will uh, serve you well uh, going forward. Uh, because really it's the young people who are going to make the change. And uh, so we need more ideas, and I, I think they have them. So keep going on that level uh, and make sure that everybody, you know, in the winery uh, has a say about what's going on or at least, you know, gets to say something about what's happening at that winery because I think that's how you achieve uh, your highest level. I agree with most everything Deborah and, of course, Tony um, said. It. Just to add, I really like the new, unoaked, uh, extraordinarily dry, uh, terroir-driven uh, Chardonnays that I tasted. I, I'm overjoyed at the way Syrah is coming along. There's a, American Syrahs made in California especially are, are becoming more popular in our own country, so you've got a bed already set for you to lie down on. And um, uh, more than anything else, I'm glad that I'm, I'm tasting dirt uh, because I want, to, I want to taste the stones, the minerals, and the, and the place from which these wines come. We have a group of people in Georgia, the state of Georgia and the United States are called dirt eaters because they literally eat the clay dirt uh, to help their digestion. Um, we should bring them down here to make them tasters because uh, they would be, probably do a pretty good job at <laughs> identifying a lot of things. But please make us more dirty wines. <laughs> dirt driven. Dirt driven. Dirt driven. Yeah. <laughs> it's difficult to follow that really, isn't it? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really difficult to sum it up. I think interesting things are happening in all uh, regions, varieties. Um, but it seems to be talking to everyone. You guys have a very good idea of what those good things and bad things are already. It's just a question of putting it um, into action. And that just takes time. And I think that's what I said in my talk. It's about patience. Um, you guys are naturally very ambitious, and it's great to see. But these things take time. Uh, and it's not easy to hear. It's very easy for me to say. It's not very easy for you to hear and do, but you're doing the right things. You know, we're seeing in this tasting, we've seen amazing wines, uh, really exciting wines, wines that made us feel passionate, made us argue with each other, and that's exactly what you should be doing. So, so more of the same, please. Make us argue. Make us argue again. Peter, one bad, bad thing, please. 
to tell us uh, later, after a few piscos. <laughs> I've got some bad things to say to you, but that's a different matter. Well, actually, I give a lot of information already, so I I'll, we would like to hear you guys. Well, uh, I came here expecting, of course, to love the Cabernets. Um, you, you guys are very famous um, for your iconic Cabernets that you <coughs> produce, and you're still producing them. And we're even able to see more than ever the aging potential of those wines, which is just incredible. Um, what perhaps I was less prepared for were some of the extraordinary um, new grape varieties that are emerging here. Things like Pinot Noir and the high level of Chardonnay that we saw, I think Deborah mentioned that, um, that are becoming really world class and icons of themselves. Not many of them yet, but that doesn't matter because you lead with those incredible handful of, of, of wines that are being produced from those grape varieties now. And the Syrahs as well, absolutely incredible. I taste a lot of Syrah in my job. I um, review the wines for Australia for the Wine Advocate. And I really was not expecting the incredible quality, particularly from the cooler climates that we're seeing coming out now. Um, I was lucky enough to be here quite many days uh, also last year. So uh, for me, it was very nice to see and come back and see that um, the same diversity, the same direction of diversity is still happening. Um, a lot of the things has been said uh, about terroir, the sense of place, new regions coming up. Um, but also one thing I would like to say that um, the focus is now on, on premium. Um, and there was a lot of talk about uh, value for money and, you know, that the value sh for money should be associated with something negative. Um, I don't think it should be associated with something negative. I think value for money premium is very good. I think you should comp continue to mix the focus on premium and also the focus on being a value for money uh, producing country because I think that especially for markets like Norway, where we have a very high price already. Uh, it's actually, the combination is very good. Thanks. Well, I was here only 10 months ago, so I'm, I couldn't say that I was too surprised. I went back to Sweden in, in March last year, and I wrote an article saying that uh, Chile has finally found its roots, and that comes back to the terror that everyone has been talking about. Before that, I said that Chile has had, is it, country producing wine that has had everything but soul, and this is now changing. And I would say from after tasting those 600 wines that the overall quality is very, very good. If there was something that surprised me, it was at Pinot Noirs. Pinot, very, very good, uh, less jammy than it used to be, and uh, in an overall perspective, I would also say that I'm happy that there's less oak in the wines. Pinot Noir. Syrah is also very good, extremely good in many ways. And I think that you can do a lot better in Sauvignon Blanc, very well top class Sauvignon Blanc. And if I was disappointed, I think I was disappointed on, on Chardonnays. I think, you, uh, have, uh, I think you have a great future for Chardonnay, but uh, I'm not sure if we have seen the, the top of that yet. Thank you. I, I want to add one thing, if I may, and, and that is to, to speak about weaknesses. I have a theory that a person's strength is looked at another, from another perspective on the flip side can be also their weakness. Uh, for example, the great strength of Chile, I believe, is its diversity. But it's very difficult to sell all that and work with all that. It's an it's 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 inbuilt uh, problem and issue for you to deal with that great diversity. Your strength as a people, in my view, is your enormous warmth. But its weakness is that you're too nice. You need to be not nice to stand up for yourselves and shout, I am Chile, outside the boundaries of this country. Be warm inside and not so much on the outside. Tell us what you want us to know about yourselves, out loud and with great pride. Can I? <laughs> oh, so, I'm sorry, Mark. Well, I think the, the best thing personally I had this week was the group therapy with those guys. <laughs> The discussions on wine, the passionate discussion, and to see that uh, many of the, the, the people, uh, um, the consumers in Brazil and the world, 
blame the wine critics to encourage international style wine. And it's just the opposite. We are here to encourage the ones who dare to take the risk to make different wines. And I saw those wines, we tasted those wines in the show. We liked very much the Rieslings, was a great surprise. Syrah, for example. Uh, the, the, the disappointments were maybe the Merlots also, the Viognier's, nothing interesting in the Viognier's. But please, continue uh, trying, experimenting, and amazing us. Thank you. Not le letting you out of the hook, so is there any Chilean willing to shout? <laughs> what, what, what do we stand for? I have a question then. I, I want to know who's in, the, in this room, who's in the Asian markets already? Raise hands. Okay, and, and Scandinavia? Okay, thank you. That was it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I recall during the week, um, many of you complained about the weight of the bottles. And is that <laughs> politically correct? Is that something that you, you truly feel that needs to be changed very soon? Is it relevant for Asia uh, or, or mostly for Scandinavia, Northern Europe? Uh, I would like to really try to get a, a, a little deeper understanding on, on that issue. Well, speaking uh, on behalf of much of Asia, uh, the ecological issue is we don't care, unfortunately. Uh, that doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't cross our minds. But uh, I would say be a little bit cautious about your heavy bottles because they impress some people, but increasingly in Asia, when we see that heavy bottle, it's a negative. You know, it's like a woman wearing too much makeup. Uh, it's like you're trying too hard. So if you're thinking of going that direction, I would advise against it. It tells us almost the opposite story than you expect. We say, oh, must not be very good, so they have to spend a lot on a heavy bottle. Okay? Uh, great points. Uh, even though our Prime Minister didn't sign the Kyoto, uh, we do not like heavy bottles. Uh, but I think there's a more important point. I, I learned a lot this week about bag in the box, but I'm a firm believer in innovation and change. So one of the things that I think is really interesting about the wine business, you know, the last, uh, over the last 10 years, I've been trying to convince Chileans that nobody in Canada will buy a rosé with a cork in it. And they all say, yeah, yeah, but, you know, we'll look at it, we'll study it. And so it's been 10 years, and now they have a screw cap, but they lost sales for 10 years waiting to do that. They're still putting corks in Chardonnays and, and Sauvignon Blancs that shouldn't have that. Uh, in the meantime, uh, the world has moved on. And when, when you see Ben say something about, well, screw cap is a non-issue, it's a non-issue everywhere uh, now pretty much uh, in, in the North American market, except for maybe parts of the U.S. But... But what it's done is it's changed the mentality of the consumer. So what we see in Canada now is after having debated and discussed and accept screw cap, we've learned that what's inside the bottle is more important than the bottle. So we don't mind the bag. And we don't mind a paper bag, as we've seen already uh, happen in the UK market, because if the end story is that the wine is better, we don't care about the package. In fact, uh, what's wrong with bag in a box this big we have one in Canada that's this thin and this long and this high that goes down the refrigerator door. And it's got incredible amount of space to advertise and tell your story on it. So there are many different ways to look at wine uh, in the new world. And uh, so heavy bottles, forget it. They're like smokers, you know. <laughs> First you're in a room, then you're outside the building, then you're 150 meters from the building, and then you don't smoke anymore. But eventually <laughs> it's going to happen. So, you know, you got to get with it. <laughs> Yeah, I'd, I'd agree. Sorry, yeah. So, yeah. sorry Deborah. Um, just to pick up um, on what Tony said and to go back a bit, I, uh, I've seen research suggesting for consumers it's more the height of the bottle than the weight of the bottle that's impressive. So the concept of having a heavy bottle to be impressive with a premium wine, I'm not sure where the logic is coming from. Secondly, as Tony said, it's not about bottles anymore. It's about other things. Um, B is a real opportunity for Chile to be a leader in packaging innovation, because it's happening now. 
but no one's really taking a lead with it. A couple of companies are doing interesting things. There's still a real, lots of room for imaginative solutions. I'm sure that there's a brilliant way of packaging wines at different levels in the market that we still haven't seen. So why not take a lead? Why not 2020 part of your plan is to be a leader in sustainability? Well, there's one brilliant way of going about it. Hire some people from graphic design or from logistics from different uh, disciplines and industries. Uh, we've got a guy who works at a design company, Stranger and Stranger, in London. He's launched a competition to find truly innovative thinking in how to deliver wine to consumers. And so far, the competition's been running for a year, and no one's won. So there are opportunities there. I, I just wanted to follow up his Screwcap comment, and I'm looking at Lisa in case she wanted to comment on Screwcap, but I can tell you uh, much of Asia expects Screwcap for white wines now, um, and that was driven by New Zealand. And uh, also keep in mind, uh, for our markets, most people have never handled a corkscrew, um, so they're afraid, and most of them, many of them actually can't afford it or don't want to even give up the kitchen space to have one. So particularly for white wines, highly, I highly encourage you to towards screw cap. Well, yeah. Um, yeah, and, and just following on that, logistically speaking, um, the wines survive a lot better under screw cap. I, I remember when I was um, importing wines as a wine buyer in Japan, particularly wines that had to go over the equator or um, for whatever reason might run into some heat they'd often wind up landing in Japan, um, particularly if it was the summer as well, um, leaking. Um, there were all sorts of issues with, with corks that you don't get with screw caps anyway. It doesn't mean that the wine hasn't been changed because it's been in contact with heat, but at least it's a little bit more protected un under screw caps. So logistically speaking, I think it's a really good idea. I, was, I can remember when I was um, working as a wine buyer in around 2002, 2003 in Tokyo, um, we brought in the first screw cap wines for our company anyway, and we got a little bit of resistance, but then after about um, six months, by the time we were ready to reorder, everybody was on board with it, and these were wines from Australia and New Zealand then. Um, so now Japan's pretty embracing of it. Singapore never really had an issue. They're, they're a pretty educated market, and they got the whole concept straight away, so they don't really have any issues with screw cap. Um, yeah. Could I just uh, say that in, in Scandinavia, the, the heavy bottles are just impossible. And especially if you claim to have a, an organic approach to the market, you just cannot, cannot combine that. But I would like to bring in the bag and box even at this discussion. <laughs> because uh, if you look at bottled wine, I think, I believe that within 10 years or perhaps 20 years, we will not see wines for the European market that is bottled here. It will be marketed, it will be bottled where the market is. So you will bottle wines in, in uh, Europe and you can do that with the same quality of level, uh, standard of, of, of quality. And especially when it comes to bag in box, it should not be filled here in Chile. It should be filled in Europe because that will give you an extra month uh, on the shelf and that's essen essential. Uh, I would also like to tell you about uh, bag and box in Sweden when it comes to packaging. It looks exactly like a Louis Vuitton handbag for ladies. It uh, won the award, the most prestigious packaging award in the world last year. And it's a great success. And if you're looking for new markets, especially women, that handbag is just cute. In Brazil, wine is still uh, considered a special drink for special occasions, and usually expensive, and people still uh, uh, consider heavy bottles, natural cork, necessary. So if you, uh, you, you know, bagging box is just for cheap wine, and people don't drink wine every day, so you don't have the daily consumer. It's all, uh, wine is for special occasions, and they want to screw, uh, use the screw cork and make the ritual of wine. Well, and, and that brings us back to a very important question, and that is that you have to look at, you cannot look at the world as one global market. You have to look at each, each individual market. Packaging, gift packages in, in China, extremely important. Please continue doing that, you're doing it well. If you look at, at uh, northern countries in, of Europe, it might be different. So you have to look into each individual market, and there's nothing wrong 
in, in uh, one, if, if there's something wrong in one market, it doesn't mean that it's wrong on another one. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to remind you that you have a, a form to, to fill in, a questionnaire regarding the, the seminar, the AWOCA. We, we also are asking for some feedback from you regarding what are the markets you would like to see judges coming for the next AWOCA. So please be sure to fill out the form. It's important information for us. So we have time for okay, one couple yeah, of comments. Yes. I just want to ask one question today. How many people here have a, a, a social media account, a Twitter account linked to the winery in which somebody says something interesting or meaningful from the winery at least once or twice a week? That's great. That's great, but uh, it would be great to see more, <laughs> uh, particularly when you're across the world where we are. Uh, because it's hard for us to connect with Chile. Um, just uh, for your information, Facebook is actually the strongest in Hong Kong, not Twitter. Um, China has its own Twitter, a little more difficult. It's called Weibo, but just recently they released an English language interface for iPhone only. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you, uh, I think it's like 80% of consumers in China are now on Weibo. So a great way to connect with people far away. Thanks so much. Yes, and we do have a, a strong presence of wines of Chile on social, on social networks, and that network is available to you. Actually, the more content you develop, the, the more opportunities are for us to, to communicate that, that information to, to our followers. So I think it's time for lunch. I really want to thank uh, each of you for attending. Thank you so much uh, to our judges for sharing this fantastic information with us and. We hope to see you tonight at the gala dinner for the awards ceremony. Thank you so much. Wines of Chile, the natural choice.